Hey, we're starting a new series this morning, and I hope it's going to be a good one. Discipleship 101. Discipleship is a lifelong process of following and becoming more like Jesus. If you have your Bible, uh, turn to Matthew 28. <clears throat> if you remember, Jesus uh, shared this just before he left. In his ascension, he's got his uh, disciples here, side of the hill, and uh, this was like the last thing he said before he left. This was after all the goodbyes and the hugs and see you later's and y'all take care and don't forget to water the plants. Don't forget to water the plants. <laughs> Let the dog out. You know, down here in the south, it, it takes us a good 34 five minutes to say goodbye. <laughs> You know, uh, but this was this was his final word. All authority. How much? All. What's authority mean? In charge. You the boss. Okay. Power. All the power. All the. <clears throat> all the. I'm the boss. All of it. In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and. Make disciples. Are disciples made or are they born? I mean, when we when we accept Christ and become a Christian, we are born again. So we we are we are born as followers. We're born as disciples, right? Boy, is that a tricky question? Yeah, we are born again, but just like when we have a baby. Have I told you I have a new grandson? <laughs> Jeremiah is definitely part of the family, but he's going to have to be taught and trained to grow and mature and develop in order to walk and feed himself and read and write and play piano and throw a football and drive and all of that stuff. Kirk, you hang around. We're going to need you one of these days. Okay, for... <coughs> Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now check this out. And teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. It doesn't say just go dunk them, give the name on the roll. Yeah, they're born again. Now they have to be taught. They have to be nurtured. They have to grow and mature and develop to be like Jesus. Surely I'm going to be with you always to the very end of the age. This is part of the equipping of the saints process that we read about in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. So today, Discipleship 101. Please tell me how to be accountable. Maybe that's why it's not more here today. They say, oh, you're preaching on that? Well, <laughs> I'm starting off with a heavy duty. Okay? <clears throat> if we're to be His disciples, we got to first understand who's in charge. Does that make any sense? You start a job, you need to know who your supervisor is. Who's the boss? And, and a lot of times we, we start a job and we get in, we get working, and here's a co-worker that for whatever reason believes they're our boss. And so they try to give us direction and tell us things we need to be doing, and we're going, you're not the boss of me. I don't think I need to be doing that. Okay. Because Larry told me I need to, oh, what does he know? He's never down there doing anything. He just sits up in his office and plays solitaire on his computer. Well, he's still the boss. If we're going to be his follower, if we're going to be his disciple, we need to understand who's going to be in charge. Foster, a couple of weeks ago, so rightly said, Jesus cannot only be our Savior. He must also be our Lord and our Master. The one to whom we must be accountable. That's a big word. 
your kids or grandkids come in and say, what's this word? What's this word mean? What's this word accountable mean? And so what are you, you going to say? What does accountable mean? Okay, you're responsible for what you do. There's the, there's the word count. You can see that there, Abby. The word count's right in the middle of accountable. Count. Okay. We, we have to give account of the things we do. The things we say, the things we do. What about the things we think? Because nobody knows about that. What do you know there, Jimmy? <laughs> oh, well, 52 years, yeah, maybe Billy knows what you're thinking. <laughs> Probably she does. Yeah. Or, or maybe you're like, I wasn't thinking. That's usually my thing with Tina. Sorry, honey, I wasn't thinking. God knows what we think. We have to give an account. We have to be accountable. A lady tells a story about the day she attended college at the University of California. She said one of the most popular courses on campus was a course that was entitled Survey of the New Testament. It was popular not because the students were so religious, University of California. It was popular because the professor never gave out any homework assignments at all. It was just an easy Breathe, uh, easy breezy class and he only gave one question at the end of the year and grades were based on how well you answered the question and for 20 years it had always been the same question and so the, you know word gets around and people sign up and especially members of the football team because yeah. hey I can get some credit and I don't have to think you know uh, and the question at the end of the year was always Give an accounting of the number, purpose, and the length of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys. Right quick, anybody know how many journeys he took? Oh, I guess three. Just if I was guessing. Okay. But they had to tell where he went, why he went, what he did while he was there, and, and all this stuff. It's in the book of Acts. It's, 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 it's in the Bible, and you can read that sometime. Well, students would work all year memorizing these missionary journeys and where he went, what he did, and who he was with, and whatever, so they'd be ready for the test. This lady says that one of her friends, and everybody called him Meathead, he must have, he was on a football team, he's probably a lineman or something, you know, you, you get cracked in the helmet enough times, you're just kind of there. Well, he, he was in the class, and he asked her to help him study for that exam. So they studied all semester long, and I mean, he had this stuff down pat. He knew it. And so when the day came for the final exam, they were all shocked because the professor went up to the chalkboard and for the first time in 20 years changed questions. First time in 20 years, and he goes up there and he writes this. Give a critical essay of the Sermon on the Mount. Which... I'd be going, oh. Well, a lot of the students just left the room. Had no idea what to write. Sadly, many of them didn't even know what Sermon on the Mount was. And this lady suggests she too wasn't familiar with it. She closed her notebook and walks out without a clue as to what to do, but as she walked out, she sees Meathead over there just writing and writing and writing and writing and writing, and she's thinking, well, maybe he knows some stuff we don't know. So, Next day, they come back into the class. The professor announced that everyone in the class had flunked, except for Meathead, and that he had passed with flying colors. This is what he wrote as his answer. He said, who am I to criticize this Sermon on the Mount? What I would rather do is give you an accounting of the number and purposes and length of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys. And so he did that and got an A+. Okay? <laughs> That's pretty cute. Now, you and I may never have to give an account of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys, though I had to do that a long time ago when I was in college. 
better memorize all that. And again, I'm kind of thinking, it's right there. All we have to do is look it up. <laughs> I don't know why I need to memorize that. But we're not going to have to give an account of that. But the Bible does say in our text this morning, it's a very frightening verse that we're going to get to here in a moment in Romans 14, where the Bible says that each of us must give an account of himself. God by the name of R.L. Sharp. I love this. Isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper and sawdust rings and common people like you and me are builders for eternity? Each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mask, and a book of rules. And each must make ere life has flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. Look with me at Romans 14. We're going to look at verses 1 to 12. and We have a word of prayer and we can jump into this. <coughs> Romans 14, 1 to 12. Now Paul's talking about other things. There was arguments about, you know, is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? Whatever. And kind of dealing with some of this stuff happens in our world today. You know, in John 17, Jesus prayed for us, those who would believe in Him through the apostles' teaching. What did He pray for us? Unity. Oneness. And what has the devil done? He's come and split the church over everything imaginable. And Paul's dealing with some stuff here because there are people arguing, is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? And whatever. And he's like, come on, give me a break. So, this is what he says. Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything. And that includes sweet potato fries. <laughs> but another whose faith is weak, uh, that would be me, I guess, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted him. And who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand because the Lord has made it able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Well, each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. Whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. None of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And so for this very reason, Christ died return to life so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Mm -hmm. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat him with contempt? We will all stand before God's judgment seat. For it's written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. And here it is, drum roll. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And I think that every time in our country for this topic to be addressed, it's now because there seems to be such a lack of it. There's no accountability anywhere. Pray with me, please. Father God, we're living at a time... Lord, I've had a dollar for every time I've heard somebody use the word unprecedented. We could all go retire. Things that we are seeing, reading, hearing. <laughs> we've, we've probably all said, I never dreamed in my lifetime I'd see anything like that. And I can imagine you, Father, shaking your head. But you knew it was coming. The Lord Jesus said before He comes back, things are going to get...
crazy. And even as we sang ago about being in your presence and just being able to breathe in the craziness of our world today, we just want to relax in your presence and breathe. You are our rock, you are our shelter, you are our defender, our protector. Yet, Lord, we can't just crawl under your wing and find protection. We have to understand that we've been called to be different. So I ask that you get me out of the way and you speak clearly through your word this morning and help us understand the severity of our walk that we will be held accountable for some things. Speak to me, speak through me, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. History tells us of a time 20 men had gathered in New York City. It was during the time of the administration of President Millard Fillmore, he's the one to the right, and included in that group of 20 was a guy named Daniel Webster. He was then Secretary of the State. And Webster had been unusually quiet all afternoon, so finally President Fillmore, trying to draw him in more in the conversation, just asked him, Mr. Webster, will you tell me please, what was the most important thought you've ever had? Daniel Webster was quiet for a couple of moments, and then he made this response. The most serious thought that ever occupied my mind was that of my individual responsibility to God. <clears throat> and he gathered up his papers and left the room, and everybody was speechless. Is there a more sobering thought in life today, a more sobering thought in all of eternity, that every one of us must be responsible and be accountable to God? Every man and woman, boy and girl, every Christian, every sinner, every saint, every wealthy, poor, cultured, and crude person, whether they're lettered or illiterate, must give an account of themselves to God. It's a haunting thought. This should transcend our secret sins, our wasted money, and our neglected opportunities. Paul was right when he said, every one of us must give an account of himself to God. And the emphasis here is upon the word himself. And our society has reached a point now where everybody's got a right, but nobody's got any responsibility. What a mess. But that is no excuse for us sitting around blaming and trying to condemn others. We're not even supposed to compare ourselves with others. The faults of others do not justify our own shortcomings. Every man must answer for himself. Another has said this, accountability comes in the package of life. And everyone who unties the ribbon of this choices of God's gifts must answer for himself about every item in that package. I like that. I like that. You think about there's times that we've received a gift and maybe like, oh, I appreciate that, thank you, but you know, what am I going to do with that? I remember as a kid going into my parents' bedroom one time and around the corner, in the corner of the room by the dresser, was a stack of some things and I realized in that little stack were some gifts that I'd given my dad. And that really just kind of hit me. It hit me hard. Guess you appreciated that, huh? You just stuck it over there in the corner. God has blessed us with all kinds of gifts and as we open up the gifts of life, we have to, what are you going to do with that? You can stick it in the corner? You can put it up on a shelf in the closet? You put it on eBay, garage sale, toss it in the trash, or are you going to use the gifts that God's given you? So what do we mean by accountability? Accountability suggests stewardship. And many think that stewardship's only about the giving of money, and they're quite similar, but they're not the same thing. 
Stewardship and giving are not synonymous. Giving is an expression of stewardship. Stewardship's more than just giving money. Stewardship's a giving of ourselves. Remember when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden? God came looking for them. He had a question, you remember? Who are you? Do you suppose God actually said, Come out, come out, wherever you are. <laughs> Why would God ask, where are you? <laughs> Didn't he know? He wanted them to control me. He's putting responsibility on them. Today, we're like, I'm not responsible for anything. I want all my rights, all my freedoms. I'm not responsible. From the, from the get-go, God put the responsibility on us. Where are you? And ever since that time, the cry of the ages from the Creator to His creation has been, where are you? And the question is not, where's your money? Where's your time? Where's your interest? The question is, where are you? God wants a total man. There's not any area of our life that can be marked off to say, well, this is mine. God, I'll follow you. I'll serve you. Except over here. It doesn't happen that way. We're either a steward of all or not at all. Just how, it, how it's got to be. Christian stewardship is a lifetime disposition of oneself and all of self is being included upon the altar of our service and stewardship. Paul writes to the church at Rome and he says, present yourself as a, what kind of sacrifice? A living sacrifice. And it's just so dead come easy to crawl off that altar. Wait right here, Lord. Wait. Wait in the truck. I'll be back. Ten minutes at the most. He goes, no, nah, I think I'm going to go with you. No, nah, it's all right, Lord. You just stay here. And he says, well, you know what? If I can't go with you, you just better stay in the truck too. Stewardship is like the old backwoods boy who had no, no schooling. Wasn't taught as he grew up. He gets a questionnaire regarding his induction in the armed services. Papers after papers, pages and pages of questions he had to answer. And he's struggling trying to figure out what this was and trying to make an answer somewhere. And I mean, he couldn't make heads or tails of it. He knew what it was about, but he didn't understand all the specifics. So finally, just across the front page, he writes, I'm ready when you are. And I think that's what the Lord wants of us. Lord, I'm ready when you are. Whatever you want, whatever ministry opportunity, whatever whatever there is, wherever you need me, whatever you want from me, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I found this interesting. The American Baptist Foreign Mission Society has a seal, and on the front of it, as you can see, there's an ox standing by a plow, and behind it is an altar, and the caption or the banner reads, ready for either. Isn't that cool? Well, what does that mean? You look at it, you think, what's, what's on this inscription? Well, a good steward is ready always to either give or to give up. Ready for service like the ox and the plow, or ready to be the sacrifice on the altar. That's the accountability. So, right quick, what are some areas, practical areas of accountability? Because God will hold us accountable. How about our words? You probably know this little song. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little mouth, what you say. Jesus says, I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken. Does that bother you? You're like, what? <clears throat> Just curious, anybody do any gossiping this week? Have you heard? 
Did you know, do you know what she said? But then he said, Every careless word. Solomon says a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Some of the pet sins of church people, the stuff like gossip and criticism and slander. I had to help some people understand several years ago that criticism is not a gift of the Spirit. It's not a spiritual gift. Preacher buddy had an old lady in his church and she said, my spiritual gift is to keep you in line. <laughs> Show me the verse and I'll listen to you. You know, it's just like, good grief. One day we're going to have to give an account. We even, and guys, this gets heavy and it can weigh us down. We even have to give an account because there's times that we can be misunderstood in the words that we speak and it causes harm to somebody. Has that ever happened to you? Often the purest of intentions and most innocent of comments can be grossly misunderstood or misinterpreted. And I think sometimes that's a danger of Facebook and certainly a danger of emails. I had a fellow in church one time and I told him, no more emails. No more emails. Because you can hide the anonymity of some of your stuff. I recently, sometimes we say stuff and it didn't come out right. That happens to me all the time. My tongue gets tangled over my eye teeth and I can't see what I'm saying and it comes out wrong. There was a doctor that traveled several miles out in the country to see a farmer that was feeling ill. When I check on him and the old farmer said, well, you know, you come out here a long way, doc, just to treat me. And the doctor says, that's okay. It's not a problem. I have another patient just down the road, so I thought I'd just kill two birds in one stone. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad you came. <laughs> That's not what he meant, but it just didn't, didn't come across right. Have you ever made an innocent statement like that, and the connotation was just flipped upside down, and you're like, oh, 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 oh no, 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 I, I don't mean, that ever happened? Am I the only one? that has ever Thank you, Gene, for I'm saying, yeah, preacher, you know, get up dumb guys ever done something like that. You know, there were several others going, yeah. yeah. Uh, sometimes it's not even what we say, but the way we say it can be taken wrong. And so realizing as I'm working on this that this is kind of getting heavy, and I, I, I thought, I need to lighten this up just a little bit. And so at the risk of messing up what I've just talked about, I want to share with you my, my top, what, how many, what do I have here? I, I don't know how many I've got. My top choices out of over 100 <laughs> bulletin bloopers. Okay. I want to lighten this up just a little bit. Now, some of these have actually, I've had a secretary that has done some of these, but not all of these. But I just love these. You know, you're, you're typing along. By the way, these are the fastest hunting pecking, hunting pecking fingers in the state of Texas, okay? I can't type, but I just get in there and I get going. And a lot of times I won't catch something until I get up to preach. And the word from says form. And I'm thinking, well, you dumb computer, you ought to know that doesn't make sense. But and and, and I and I type words, and it comes up in red, like we don't even know what you're trying to put in here, and we don't have a clue even how to correct the word that you're typing in. But I've I've had church secretaries in the past that will get to typing up something and they don't check their stuff, and that's why I'm so thankful we don't have bulletins because it's just. And I know some of you don't have. Anything where you can color in the B's and the D's and the A's and the... Anyway, I love this. Probably my top choice. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <laughs> Does that mean 
you didn't know we had the nursery or you didn't know you had any kids. I just, <laughs> I think it's great. How about this? The preacher will preach his farewell message, after which the choir will sing, To God Be the Glory. <laughs> That's tied with the next one for number two. The preacher shared that the Lord Jesus is calling to another ministry. The choir then sang, what a, <laughs> what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> Potluck supper will be Thursday evening, prayer and medication will follow. It's <laughs> hard to catch that, you know. I like this. The ushers will eat the latecomers. <laughs> Left an S out there. When I was a little boy, I called them hushers. Because they would go around and go, Ricky. The Reverend Merriweather spoke briefly, much to the delight of the congregation. <laughs> During the absence of our pastor, we enjoyed the rare privilege of hearing a good, good sermon <laughs> when J.F. Stubbs supplied the pulpit. Everybody enjoyed that but the preacher. He's like, what? <laughs> Next Sunday, Mrs. Vincent will be the soloist for the morning service. The pastor will then deliver his message entitled, What a Terrible Experience. <laughs> So you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's just stuff that people have caught and like, did they think that through? Remember in prayer the many that are sick of our church and community. I had a, I had a secretary at a church years ago up in the panhandle. Two Christmas songs that she messed up. Number one, Hard the Herald Angels Sing. <laughs> so everybody stand up, we're gonna sing real hard this morning. You know, people just giggling. She's back there, oh cool. And angels we have heard get high. <laughs> I thought we need to lighten up a little bit because we're gonna go back deep here in a minute. Don't let worry kill you, let the church help. The church's sweat heart banquet will be held this coming Friday evening at 7. That was actually in our bulletin. Oh, <laughs> the bean supper will be held Tuesday evening. Music will follow. <laughs> <laughs> the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> Weight Watchers will meet... It's 7 o'clock. Please use the large doll doors in the side entrance. The self-esteem support group will meet Thursday. Please use the back door. <laughs> Miss Charlene Mason saying, I will not pass this way again. Giving, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. <laughs> Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a good chance to get rid of those things that are not worth keeping around the house. Remember to bring your husbands. <laughs> it's just... That wasn't the intent, but... This morning's message, Jesus walks on water. Tonight's message, searching for Jesus. <laughs> You'd have to be on a church board to get this. The agenda, the agenda was adopted, minutes were approved, and the financial secretary gave a grief report. <laughs> their brief grief report. Please let us welcome our new pastor, Don, who is a caring individual who loves hurting people. <laughs> One more. If you, if you must heave during the service, please do so quietly. <laughs> We will be accountable for our words, also our influence. Carlson's just came back from a visit up north. And Abby, I found out that a few weeks ago when you guys made some cards for Drake, mm -hmm. he liked those more than anything else he's gotten. Mm -hmm. 
Y'all had a positive influence. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Oh, they're just kids. That's just junior church. That's just babysitting. No, it's not. That's not. They're involved in ministry. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. I tell you, so, so this happened this week at our house. And I had another example I was going to put it that I had in here, but I took it out to put this because Tina trains new tellers at her location at First National. And just this past week, one of the new trainees and his expecting wife went to get an ultrasound to see whether they're going to have a boy or a girl. Following the doctor's visit, they came back to the bank asked to see Tina, and they gave her an envelope that held the much-anticipated news. What do y'all call him? G? G. Nickname G. And he gave Tina the envelope and said, will you open this? Tina said, what is this? Well, that's, that tells us whether we're having a boy or girl. She said, why are you giving it to me? I want you to open it. In essence, saying, I want you to be the first one to see. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> Tina opened it up. She looked at it and gave it back to him. They opened it up, and the, I guess the celebration began with happy feet and happy dance. And, yay, they're going to have a little girl and all that. Tina's telling me about this and how cool she thought that was. While she's talking, tears were welling up in my eyes. And I'm thinking, why would these people that have known her less than two weeks, why would they go for a monumental thing in their life and come back and give the envelope to her so that she would be the very first person to know what's on board? Why? Because somewhere she's made an influence. And she's telling me that, and I'm crying, I'm saying, God, you've blessed me with this girl. And, and she's been influencing me for years. Most of it for the good. <laughs> what influence do we have on people all the time? With your attitude and the way you do, when, when people see you coming in their restaurant again, or in their store again, or they're like, Oh, hey, good to see you. Or they're like, oh, man, they're back. We're going to have to give an account of our influence. We're going to have to be accountable for our time. Time is man's measurement about life. John Wesley was asked one time, if you knew the Lord was going to come tomorrow night, how would you spend your day? And this was his reply. I'd spend the day as I intended to spend it. I'd preach, I'd teach, I'd go home, I'd go home and eat. I'd pray and return to my room and then I'd wake up in glory. Guys, we should spend every day as if that's our last day. Amen. Every day as if this could be the day I see Jesus face to face. Guys, we don't know. And I think most of you have heard about Randy this week. Had a pretty heavy duty stroke midweek. Last Sunday, we're back here and we're laughing and teasing about anniversaries. That they've got an anniversary coming up and he can't remember how many years it was. And he was trying to be cool and go with the labels, keeping him reminded. And we're just teasing and laughing about that. But we have fellowship on Tuesday morning. And Randy's in rehab right now, trying to figure out how to talk straight. And that's getting better, but it's. Other stuff is still messed up and he can't walk well yet. It breaks my heart. Because he's my little buddy. And I'm thinking, buddy, you better get together because a whole bunch <laughs> of kids going to be looking for you around Christmas time. Because he plays Santa a lot. We just don't know. We're going to have to be accountable for our time. We need to live. So every day could be the day we're going to meet Jesus. We're going to be accountable for our love. And we're at our best when we're sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Tolstoy tells a story about a Russian beggar who had stretched out his hand to him asking for some money during a famine. And he wished he could share a gift, but he didn't have anything. 
So he knelt down and apologetically took the beggar's hand and said, Please don't be angry with me, my brother, but I have nothing to give you. To which the beggar responded, Oh, but you have given me a great gift. You just call me brother. And that's a gift far greater than any coins you would be able to share. God has given every one of us as Christians the ability to love and He's going to hold us accountable for how we share His love. Our material possessions, we're going to be held accountable for what we do with our money. I don't want to see a show of hands, but I'm just curious. Are we all tithers in here? Maybe we need a message on the Sermon on the Amount. <laughs> Catch that one. Well, you know, I, man, I work hard for what I got, and I, I need to spend a little bit over here. And... Saw Jimmy yesterday, he's got this mask on with this deal that says, I heart H E B. I heart H E B. Somebody asked him, Oh, do you really love H E B? And he goes, Might as well have my paycheck goes over there, you know. <laughs> well, hey, we got to eat. We got to. Guys, I have. I have known folks for over 40 years of ministry, those that are faithful in their tithing, and offerings are above that, they're faithful, faithful givers, they have not had a need that God didn't take care of. Amen. My parents were very faithful in their tithing and in their giving. It's the only place in Scripture where God says, test me. And see if I won't pour out so many blessings you can't handle it. And, and since Riverside started, we're making a fraction of what we used to make. But we feel so blessed. We don't need anything. We've got money in savings. So it's getting ready to go to the government. But we're doing okay. <laughs> God's blessed us. He will do that. We're going to be held accountable for our neglected opportunities. We're going to have to give an account of the failures as well as our successes. And the real failure is often that we don't try. Another has said this, life's greatest failures come not to those that start out to succeed and then stumble, but to those that are afraid to even start out in the first place. Yeah, hating, stealing, killing, lying, those are all sins. But Jesus said there's another sin, and that's the sin of just not doing anything. One day Jesus was walking along with His disciples. They came by a fig tree. If you remember this story, numerous beautiful leaves, Jesus cursed it and it immediately withered and died. Why? Was it because the figs on it were poisonous? No nope. There were no figs. It was in season, but there was no fruit. That tree was there for a reason and a purpose, and it wasn't doing what it was supposed to. So as an object lesson, Jesus said, Hey guys, learn from this. <laughs> <laughs> or however that goes in Aramaic. I don't know. <laughs> and he cursed it. Because it was bearing no fruit at all. It was useless. We're supposed to bear fruit. And when we waste opportunities, we're going to have to give an account for those neglected opportunities. Remember, uh, there was a guy that was beat up on the way from the road to Jericho and a, and a priest and a Levite. What what they do? They stopped and helped? Remember how that... No. no. what they do? They passed by on the other side. They had an opportunity. They neglected that. Hmm. Would we suppose that they're going to have to give an account? Mm -hmm. oh, they did that. <clears throat> Buried a man this week, 87 years old. Visiting with the family. Same question I ask everybody. What can you tell me about his faith journey? What were his beliefs? Well, dad wasn't much of one on church. Really never had time for church and church stuff. He was just about life. 
two or three thoughts back here. My first thought was, why the same hell do you want a preacher? What am I supposed to be talking about? Does he have any idea where this life came from? Yeah. And then I got to thinking about this. How many people along his journey of 87 years didn't do anything to tell him that one of these days... And he was, he was an accomplished trumpet player. And I'm thinking, I have a quick segue right there. When Jesus comes back... There's going to be a horn blasting. You could be in that group. Wasted opportunity. In almost every area of our lives, we need to understand that we're going to have to be accountable. We accept the principle of accountability. We, we seek to fulfill the role of a good servant. Our lives are changed. We find new significance in living. We see ourselves as a partner with God. Every day takes on new meaning. Every thought, new potential. Every dollar, new power. Every opportunity, new possibilities. And it helps us to think through some things because if we're going along and we start to think, Jesus, just stay in the truck. I'll be back. He goes, okay, well, whatever you're going to go do, remember, you're going to be accountable for that. And it's not really going to work for you to tell me to stay in the truck because I know what you're going to go do anyway. Yeah. And so if we get this in our thinking, I'm going to be accountable for this. I mean, the Lord's working on me on this thing. Ricky, there may be some things you need to think about before you go do. Let me close with this. In Germany, 1939, Nazis were at the height of their power. And this little thing appeared in a Berlin newspaper, and it signifies the militant, aggressive behavior of the dictatorship that seeks to conquer the wills of men as well as their bodies. Check this out. We have captured all the positions on the heights. We planted the banners of our revolution. You can imagine that was all that we wanted. But we want more. We want all. Your hearts are our goal. It is your souls that we want. Could that be said today? Possibly. But I would suggest that we hear God saying that to us. Every one of us is going to give an account. He doesn't just want our money or our time or our influence. He wants more. He wants it all. Our hearts are His goal. Our souls, that's what He wants. But He didn't come as a dictator. He comes with no armies, no sword, no uniform. He's just a carpenter's son. Lowly Galilean. The Messiah. Who hasn't asked us to do anything that He hasn't already given us the example. But with the authority of God and the authority of heaven, He says, if any man will come after Me, Part of being accountable, you've got to deny yourself daily, take up your cross, and follow Him. For whoever loses his life, for Christ's sake, is going to find it. Guys, it's our heart that He wants, our soul. He wants us. And we've got to be accountable. And I can't have a personal God without personal accountability on my part. So I pray that this will be a, a good series for us to get into. We're going to look at prayer next week. Jesus and his guys have been hanging out for a while and they keep noticing him doing this. He's just, he's just always over here doing this. So they, they said, Hey, will you teach us how to pray? He said, Sure. And there's some other things about our walk with Him that we'll be looking at. If you have a question about something or whatever, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll see what the Bible says about those things. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank You for the truth of Your Word. Oh, Lord. 
Thank you for telling us the truth. Thank you for being honest with us. We're, we're not just in this life to be floating around like a feather on a breeze. It's not just a game. Our steps are marked for us. You created us on purpose. You direct our paths and there's sometimes that we encounter things and we go, wow, that was a that was a wild coincidence, but in reality it was a God incident because you're working your will, you're orchestrating the lives of people for a purpose and a reason. And and true, we, we have the gift of choice. We can tell you, no, I'd I'd rather stay home. Or we can trust you to lead us. And Father, as many of us have experienced, when you call us to do something, if we'll take that step of faith, you give us the words to say. Yeah. You open the doors. You provide what needs to happen. And sometimes we step back and we go, wow, that was awesome. Thank you for allowing us to be partners with you in your kingdom work. Teach us, mold us, shape us, help us to grow and mature and develop because we want to be more like you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.